You are now listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the House by the Video Store podcast. I'm your host, William, and joining me today will be Sean. Hello. And Derek. Hello. And we're going to be discussing Shaun of the Dead, the seminal zombie film from director Edgar Wright. Uh, But before we get to that, we're going to briefly go through uh, the things we've been watching and some news uh, so we can start on the what we've been watching with Sean. Uh, yeah, I, today, actually, I saw Black Mass, Johnny Depp, not horror related, um, but just real quick, it, it was pretty good, I enjoyed it a lot, the last half, and actually, Johnny Depp's not in it that much, <laughs> not because, like, anything happens, it's just, they follow, like, parallel storylines, sort of, well, I mean, it's, it's, it starts out as kind of one big story, um, the FBI and, and him, and, and it's kind of, like I said, one story, but then towards the end, they focus on the FBI side. So that was kind of disappointing not to see him in, in it as much. And he's not doing a lot of like organized crime in the last part of the movie. Like he's doing it, but they don't show it. They just say, oh, you know, well, he did this or he did that. Um, it, it was good. It was, it looked really, really awesome. Loved the way it was shot. Um, but it just kind of had some pacing issues, I think. And, and it was telling a big story. It was set between the seventies and essentially, I guess, to the early nineties, possibly. But uh, or, or more so, seventies than nineties, and then some stuff in the nineties. Um, but yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it, but uh, unfortunately, it just probably wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and then I watched um, Fear the Walking Dead, but this was what episode are they on now? Fifth. Uh, I believe the they fifth, are on the fourth, fourth episode. The last one that just aired was the third one because they went on a two week break or something after oh, the first episodes. Yeah, so I, so I think I've watched three episodes. Yes, I have seen three episodes yeah. as well. I've not seen the one that just debuts. We're recording this on September twentieth. I have not seen the one that came on tonight. I uh, had did not have a chance to watch it, but yeah, how are you feeling about that? So. I think, um, not really spoiling anything, I think that they have a couple of characters where you can clearly see, like, okay, so this is the conscientious objector who's mm-hmm. like, oh, we shouldn't kill people. Yeah. Then we have the characters like, I don't give a crap, I'll kill anybody. And then you have, so you're starting to see these characters already, like, laid out. It's like, this is going to be the one that almost gets everyone killed. And this will be the person that actually comes through and does something, probably. Yeah, who are filling these ar- archetypical roles of zombie films and <laughs> and The Walking Dead also? And it's just um, like it depend. Like I don't know what the budget for this show was compared to the the regular Walking Dead, but uh, and two, I think they kind of passed over some opportunities to do more interesting things with, uh, like because they've had a couple of things like there's like mobs who are upset that like somebody got killed by the police and mm-hmm. and then like a zo- like the zombie outbreak is happening and. They could have done a little bit more with that and a little bit less of people just sitting around inside of like a confined space, but yeah. Yeah. Well, the, haven't we learned from the uh, Walking Dead they love to just have people sitting around in confined spaces with drama? Like, yeah. oh, you didn't record my, you forgot to record my show in the middle of the zombie outbreak. And that's like two episodes because they got to find the DVR remote. <laughs> and it turns out the DVR remote is surrounded by zombies. And, three well, die. and, and they then, still, they know, still have. They got to find somebody's kid. They still have the issue of annoying kids or teenagers doing stupid stuff or not paying attention to what their parents say that would be beneficial. And it's just... Uh, and due to technical reasons, we just lost Derek for the remainder of this podcast. Uh, if you have any problems with that, you can call AT&T U-verse and complain <laughs> that they are providing subpar service in the Louisville, Kentucky area. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, that's why he missed the uh, podcast before, too. Yeah, um, so. so and when there's prospects of us getting Google, Google Fiber, so that would be that, amazing. That'll be awesome. Um, so yeah, this, I'm. I think I'm starting to drift out on the show a little bit. Like I'm gonna finish off this season because it's only six episodes, but uh, I'm just getting a little a little bored. 
you know, because they are kind of just meandering around a little bit well, at this and, point. And this weekend I was at an event with a number of different people that I haven't really talked to about television or movies lately. And we were talking about, you know, like the fear of the walking dead and somebody's like, yeah, I think it's too long at an hour. So hmm. not only is six episodes like, yeah. possibly too much, but they say like an hour long, uh, the episodes are too long. So it's yet to be seen how it turns out and, and how they go with it. Um, I mean, I guess it is interesting that you get to see the t- a timeline that bridges like the first scene of the series and the scene where Rick wakes up in the hospital after everything's already kind of went to hell. But yeah, it's just uh, if it's all just melodrama and people uh, doing dumb things in the next few episodes, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. They were stuck in the house most of the ep- last episode I watched. And I'm like, okay, finally they're leaving. And then essentially the police, or, you know, the the army comes and they're like, get back in your house. Like, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and too, there, like, there, there are some slightly interesting aspects of, like, should you go out of your way to, like, save your neighbors or, or things like that? Mm-hmm. Or do you just kind of sit back and think, like, well, they're probably going to die anyway, so no need yeah. to possibly get my entire group of people killed, but... I don't know that there'll be as much like uh, focusing on that as there is just on melodrama. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. But, um, I also watched The Wicker Man, the original one. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, it's been a while. And I've also seen yeah. the the Nicolas Cage um, version. Yeah, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think I've actually watched the Nicolas Cage one before. I feel like I like, almost did, but then I knew it was supposed to be terrible and just, just avoided it. Um but yeah, Wicker Man's awesome. First part of that movie, it's almost like um, a horror musical. And not like a horror comedy musical, but just like an actual horror film that is a musical. Just with all the singing and stuff. Like, you know, kind of creep, creepily builds up this, I guess, this the atmosphere on the island and stuff. Which I really liked. It's some weird songs. But, uh, but yeah, I like that film a lot. Um, it's a shame the remake wasn't better. Well, it definitely provided some memorable moments, such as not the bees and, <laughs> and him in the bear suit, like kicking women. <laughs> so it's that uh, one of those examples of like a movie that was a little bit more of a like, I guess, like a cult hit or more of a genre film that wasn't like a huge breakout success that got remade. I guess with the intention of bringing it to a wider audience and completely failed to stick the landing, even though at the time they got an actor who was relatively big name, they just yeah. kind of botched all the aspects of it. Yeah, I immediately watched the trailer for the remake after I watched that film because, you know, like I was thinking, there's no way this this would fly with a, you know, a bigger budget remake with, um, you know, a big headlining star. That just uh, just the format and the flow of that of that original film, and one. I don't want to say it really took away from it, but I felt like in the original film, the uh, the police officer, there was really not much character development with him at all throughout. Like it was just a series of um, small, like th- this mystery, like small details being revealed. Um, and and you kind of know who he is pretty early on, and he stays that way the entire time. You know, he's... Yeah. He's... Uh, I'm guessing is Catholic based on where they're at, but he, you know, he's Christian and he makes it well known and he's, he's like, you know, ha- has high morals and he sticks to them and everything. So, um, but, but I think it was fine for that movie, which is, which is kind of cool um, that it was able to rely on so many other things that, to make it interesting and to keep, to keep it going. Um, and it's a great ending to the film too. I like it. It, it actually, Reminded me, um, you know, a lot of hot fuzz, <laughs> just the, the town. I mean, this kind of puts it out there in front right away that, you know, something's not right. But, uh, yeah. but, but you could see a lot of, um, I guess, Wicker Man and Hot Fuzz rewatching those. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, Hot Fuzz, cause you know, we're talking about Shaun the Dead in this episode, but like Hot Fuzz is a movie that was kind of. At one point, kind of like a take on like Bad Boys 2 or Point Break, Point Break and things like that. But then it was also kind of like a slasher too. Mm-hmm. And then you know, like you said, like Wicker Man or things like that, like the small town 
yeah. um, environment. So it had a lot of elements of things like that in it that it took, you know, influences from. And if you've listened to any of the things that Edgar Wright has ever done, like he has seen, you know, almost every movie that you could think of, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, is influenced by so many things. And he brings a lot, he, a lot of, he blends genres and he kind of brings a lot of things together and everything's just so layered in his films. So it, it's fun watching like, yeah, it's fun watching movies and, and knowing his, his taste and everything kind of picking out like this very, you know, very much seemed like it was something that probably influenced some decisions he made with this film or, you know, some of this, the, the plot beats and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think that was pretty much all I can remember watching. Uh, oh, this week we did, um, a trailer talk for Dead End Drive In, which is uh, another Australian film. Um, Brian Trichard Smith directed that. He did he did several um, Australian, I guess, cult hits like The Man from Hong Kong and I believe Escape Two Thousand, which I think Turkey Shoot was the alternate title for that. Um, he's a favorite of Tarantino's. Uh, Dead End Drive In, like I said, it's, we did a trailer talk, so I just kind of. Uh, a, a brief synopsis and review, if you want to even call it a review. But um, I like that film. It it could have been it could have been more, I think. But essentially, um, I'll give away the trailer talk for the most part. But essentially, it's uh, kind of made in a post Mad Max world where you know Mad Max was a huge hit, um, The Road Warrior. And so Brian Chinchart Smith made, made this film. It's very much in the same post-apocalyptic setting, just kind of um, civilization still is still kind of hanging on for the most part. Um, but there's a lot of these Australian punks that are out terrorizing everybody. Um, so there's a drive-in that a lot of people go to, I guess, you know, on Friday night or Saturday night. Well, when they go, they essentially lock them in and don't let them leave. But they give them like meal tickets and a bunch of other stuff. And most of them really don't care, I guess, because the world is in such disarray anyway. So it's, you know, it's got a little a little political commentary on, on you know, the way the government's handling the situation of, of these people. And then it also does, deals with, like, some racism. Like, they bring in um, some, like, buses full of Asians and <laughs> people start yelling racial <laughs> slurs at them. And, 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 but aside from that, the, the middle part of the movie, it's just a lot of them kind of hanging out in the drive and all these punks and stuff, which is fun. I mean, there's a little bit of drama. The main character's name's Krabs and he's, he's, he's like a weakling. Um, but, uh, but the end, the end of the movie is pretty good. They have awesome stunts at the end of the film. Um, but yeah, you can check out the trailer talk, see some footage from it. It's on streaming free on shutter right now, which is that essentially like a horror Netflix site. Um, and then you can read it on Amazon prime. Yeah. And then I played a lot of Metal Gear <laughs> as much as I could. I had time for. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a number of people like my PlayStation Three died, and I've never, I've never bought a new system yet, and so I currently have no system. So I, you know, there's a lot of games I want to play that I have not had a chance to play yet. But that definitely is something I want to check out because I've, you know, loved all the other games in the series. Yeah, this one, this one's a long one, um, and which is awesome. But I'm trying to make my way through it before I hear any story spoilers. Yeah. I, I want to like, I can't stop playing it as well. Like I want to play it as much as possible, but at the same time, just got other stuff going on. And of course the site stuff, getting that stuff done as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so as far as the things I've watched this week, I really didn't have much time to watch anything. Uh, just cause I was busy and went out of town this weekend, but uh, Derek and I did record a video blog that'll be going up this week. Uh, where we discussed Silence of the Lambs. So we're just kind of going back through some of the bigger franchises that we haven't done videos on yet and just, you know, kind of talking about them. And, you know, that's another movie. I, that, so that is one of the few things I watched this week. And it's one of those movies that, you know, was made in the early 90s. But aside from the clothing and the hair, it's, you know, a pretty timeless movie. Nothing about mm -hmm. it's really dated. You can easily, you know, pop it in and watch it. And, and you know, too, in the video blog we discussed, you know, like, it won, it, it won the Oscar for Best Picture, Best Male and Female Actor and Actress, Best uh, Screenplay, Best Director. So, like, and people considered it to be a horror movie, or at least partially horror and in that genre. So, it was kind of one of those prestige movies that 
I think kind of, you know, show people, oh, you can make a prestige film that has, you know, heavy horror elements in them and yeah. gore, and it's fine. Because, uh, you know, like, other movies that were nominated for Cameo Awards that kind of were considered horror at the time were The Exorcist and Jaws. And neither one of those movies won the Best Picture, but they're at least nominated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, Sounds of Lambs is kind of the only horror film that's ever won the Best Picture or a film that you consider horror that's won yeah. the Best Picture. And, you know, based on the way things are doing right now, it might be one of the only ones that ever does because they have, uh, horror films have not done well at the well, Oscars. Yeah, and, and two, you know, it's, I mean, to be honest, some of the appeal to horror films are, are the gore and the kind of the lowest common denominator um, entertainment appeal, you know, yeah. just seeing people get murdered and killed. <laughs> so it's, I can understand why the track record isn't very high because I think there is just, you don't, you don't have to be a huge film fan to, you know, you don't have to be an, a big intellect to enjoy some of the, the lower the lower, I guess the more crass horror films out there, like people, people like seeing gore. They just, they like seeing that stuff. Even if the story isn't there, you know, it's apparent there's a lot of cult films that, that have like maybe a, maybe a somewhat interesting concept, but sometimes they rely on the gore and the kills and stuff like that to, yeah. to kind of stay alive. So you could see a lot of people that are drawn to directing those films are into that same stuff and they're not really concerned with, um, you know, sometimes it's style over substance on those things, which isn't bad. You know, it's fun, but yeah, it's always great finding and watching like awesome horror films. You can kind of sink your teeth in that, that really seem like they do more, you know, like, yeah. I mean, the w Wicker Man also like that's, that's an awesome, awesome film. That's just, the idea is not like it's super crazy, but it's an interesting idea. It's presented in a different way. Um, you know, I, I like any film, any horror films that, that kind of break the mold. Um, yeah, and Silence of the Lamb, it, it blends that kind of thriller, mystery with with some horror and stuff. Yeah, I mean, And that, that's the secret to getting in is, is blending genres. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's like, you know, that movie was very successful financially, critically, pretty much any way you can imagine. But I think, too, there's a tendency in a lot of reviewers is the second you, you know, have a little bit of gore in there, and things like that, then it immediately makes them like put it into a category that's like, oh, it doesn't matter how good or how well this is done. This is just something that, you know, is going to be a B movie, in my yeah. opinion. And I think, too, like, you know, tonight's actually the night of the Emmys. And in TV, you see very much the same attitude because, you know, like, actually earlier I made a tweet when I was looking at some of the uh, the winners of these earlier awards. If the voters behind the Emmys were also food critics, they would have probably given numerous awards to Chili's and Pizza Hut by now because they very much give awards to the things yeah. that are popular like Big Bang Theory and Modern Family over stuff that's more popular. So you would think at some point The Walking Dead would have won an award or got some nominations just based on how popular it is mm -hmm. and how much of an influence it's had on TV. And nobody gets nominated from that show aside from some like the makeup type categories. Yeah. And... I and Hannibal didn't really get, you know, many nominations or wins. And it's a show that I think's more, you know, much better acted and, you know, things like that than a lot of shows that do get nominated. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's weird when you see some of these these shows that, that do seem like they're the lowest common denominator. I mean, yeah, they're packed with jokes and stuff, stuff like the Big Bang Theory. It's just kind of mind boggling that as far as Oscars go. You know, they have these Oscar bait shows, I guess, that, that at least, even if they are kind of seen as films that are just made to win an Oscar, they typically try to do something more or, you know, kind of bring to light certain issues or, or tell, tell, tell significant stories. But with TV, it's just, yeah, it's sometimes it's a popular popularity contest. But like, I will have to say that there have been actors and there have been nominations for American Horror Story. But mm -hmm. um, kind of like tying into the news. So there's been more trailers and things released for American Horror Story recently. And like I've watched that show through the third season. And I think it's more of just like a horror television show for people that don't really have an appreciation for horror films or have watched many. Yeah. Because the lot of stuff you see like obvious callbacks and influences. 
I mean, in, in that show, there's the second season, there's a dance number. <laughs> <laughs> and there's it, it starts off interesting in most seasons there'd be like creepy stuff but they way over explain it and by the end it's just more it's not really scary at all it's just there's some gore in it and gro- grotesque scenes but it's just like do you enjoy the characters yeah. and like this newest season they're pushing the lady gaga involvement so heavily it's like so you know what crowd they're going for mm-hmm. yeah and if that actually turns out to be any good is yet to be seen but... it, may, it may win an emmy if it gets enough viewers <laughs> You know, it, it could be one of those things, too, where the people that judge the Emmys have obviously probably been in the industry for a long time. So and a lot of the people that are running these popular shows like the Big Bang Theory have a lot of credits to their name, you know, yeah. and it may just be kind of like a, a little boys club type thing. Like, oh, that's that's my buddy or whatever. He he always does good stuff. You know, let's yeah. let's give it to him. And 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 maybe because they are they maybe share the same mentality because they're from the same generation or, you know. Who knows what it is, but yeah, it's it's very interesting to see the type of shows that win Emmys versus the type of shows that, or type of movies that win Oscars. Yeah, I mean, and two, like part of it, like with American Horror Story, so like Ryan Murphy is kind of one of the people that's like the driving force behind it. And if you're not aware of his work, he he actually created Nip Tuck, uh, which is a show that uh, did you watch any of that when it was on originally? No. Uh-uh. So like the first is about two plastic surgeons that you know make a lot of money and of course it has a lot of drama and stuff and that show i thought started out strong like the first couple of seasons are pretty good but then they got to one plot line that had like a serial killer that was involved in it and it just it just got <laughs> weird and stupid and so you know and then he also made uh glee and and then there's also the upcoming Scream Queens, which is, for, you know, some of the same, you know, Ron Murphy, some of the same talent and some of the same actresses. It's like Emma Roberts has been, she was in um, season three of American Horror Story and is going to be in that show with Jimmy Lee Curtis. And it's yet to be seen how that's going to turn out. I don't, I don't think that it's going to be any worse than MTV Scream. Yeah. Uh, just because at least with the Ron Murphy shows, they do have a sense of humor and they do have fun, and they do have somewhat of an identity, which where yeah, the scream that, just felt yeah. kind of ident like it felt like there was no identity to it. Yeah, that is a good point. They at least have an identity and and a personality, and it may not match the stuff that we're drawn to, but uh, but it seemed like there's a reason for them to exist. You know, they have yeah. a, a, a they're they're providing something to an a very specific to an audience. Um, so yeah, even though it's I'm not into Glee. Um, <laughs> I, I get the appeal to some people, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's the same and, thing. Like, they might not have any interest in Ash vs. Evil Dead. That's, like, my most anticipated show. Yeah. So it's, yeah. you know, just different genre audiences. Yeah. Good and not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and did you see the story about Jamie Lee Curtis recreating the scene from Psycho? Yeah, the one that, that her, her mother was in. Yeah, that her mother was in. Um, I saw some people saying it was disrespectful, but... <laughs> Because it's like a comedy show and not, you know. But hey, if it's her mom, she can. Yeah. If anybody can recreate it, it should be her. Yeah. I mean, she has. If any, like you said, like if anybody can recreate these classic scenes, like, you know, the daughter of the person who's in it, yeah. I think has the right to do it. And especially yeah, if it's, who, who is a horror icon of her own right, you know. Anyway, I'm assuming, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis has been around long enough that she probably knows if it was being, what, like, done well and made sense and was yeah. respectful. Or, but then again, she was in Halloween resurrection yeah i think that was more of a contractual obligation than anything but uh other last bit of of little tv news here before we start discussing sean the dead is uh the mist so the stephen king story that was adapted into a movie starring thomas jane will be made into a tv series there aren't a whole lot of details right now as to what network it would go to or what exactly the story is but uh i mean i think that world is uh, something that could be revisited in an interesting way. Uh, so did, did you have any thoughts on the movie? I, I really like the movie a lot. Um, you you recommended it at the time because you're like, yeah, you know, because you were very conscious of the budget they had and what they accomplished with it. And yeah, it's just all out good film. Um, but, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're writing on the success of The Walking Dead sticking characters in a certain place for an entire season and yeah. not going away. So like, hey, we can just stick them in a convenience store and cover it with mist and call, call it a day. Yeah, like even the even the movie The Mist, so it was in 2007, and it had Thomas Jane, um, 
that actually when you watch this movie, it had a bunch of people that ended up in The Walking Dead, but it was directed by Frank Darabont, who was the director of the first episode of The Walking Dead and the showrunner for the first two seasons. So that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was a movie where the special effects in some case, some cases aren't that great. Yeah, the CGI is a little suspect because the they're flying things. Their budget was $18 million. And with some of the stuff they had on screen, it's like they accomplished quite a bit with what they had. But it was also 2007 and kind of a lot of movies from that era plagued with the pretty bad CGI when you actually think about it. But the did you see the black and white version of the movie? No, I knew they had it on the DVD, Yes, yeah, so I haven't I, watched it. So I watched that, and I think that actually helps kind of clean up some of the effects and kind mm-hmm. of helps, you know, obscure it a little bit more and just adds to the atmosphere and makes it, you know, the I think the better viewing, viewing experience to watch it is to watch it in black and white, but I mean, it's a movie I enjoy. It's nothing that's like on any of my top 10 list or anything like that, but anything Frank Darabont does is usually worth, you know, some attention and give, giving it a shot because he's done a lot of great adaptations of Stephen King stories. It was definitely a highlight of the year it came out, you know, and it's one that obviously has stuck around in the public consciousness at some part, you know, especially because the ending of that film is so, so great. Yeah, so we'll have to see what they do with the TV series. I, mean, I could totally see it being a uh, something that ends up on sci-fi network and is that type of show but yeah you can also go to you know a network but let's have to see what they do with it so i guess we can go ahead and move into our discussion now of Shaun of the dead the 2004 rom-com zom movie from edgar wright and you know actually when this movie came out i remember the advertisement for it you know pretty heavily saying like oh it's a romantic comedy with zombies yeah and it was a British movie that, like, I think I had some buzz about it before it got here to the States, but, you know, of course it didn't have the budget and the the advertising budget of some of the bigger films. Yeah, I remember commercials running for it, though, because I, it looked very appealing to me. Um, I just never made it out to the original. Did you see it in theaters when it came to the U.S.? No, I did not, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I wanted to, and I just never made it out to it, because um, I remember the commercials, and then... I, I had a buddy of mine that I worked at GameStop. He's very much into films, and he's like, "Oh man, you've got it. You've got to get that when it comes out on a DVD." And I'm like, "Yeah, I figured I would like it." And he was like, "Trust me, just buy it. Just trust me." <laughs> and he was absolutely right. So I just like, I was like, "All right, I trust this dude enough." He, you know, we kind of share the same love for zombie movies at the time, um, and the same style of them, and and appreciation for them, and just films in general. And it definitely was. Yeah, it's, as you and I talked, we don't even really need to re- rewatch this film again because we've seen it so many times over the years. And and two, like, so the landscape of when this movie came out, so it was 2004, the same year as the Dawn of the Dead remake, and after uh, 28 Days Later, kind of kicked off the, the zombie genre again, or the, un, the infected or undead or just... Um, slow moving or fast moving people that will bite you and you become infected and turn movies inspired by George Romero films. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to kind of more succinctly. Yeah. Uh, even if uh, they're not zombies, they're obviously inspired by classical zombie films. And so it came out in that kind of atmosphere of, you know, those movies has started to get made again. Cause they, there was a while where there weren't many movies in the zombie genre or the infected genre that were getting made. Especially ones that were being released to, to theaters. You know, there was yeah. obviously there's always those low budget films made by horror fans. But t- 28 Days Later is the first one I remember seeing in theaters in high school. Um, and I saw the Dawn of the Dead remake as well. And, and, you know, just to like, so I guess the brief synopsis of the movie, if you weren't aware, uh, and this will come from IMDb. A man decides to turn his moribund life around by winning back his ex-girlfriend, reconciling his relationship with his mother, and dealing with an entire community that has returned from the dead to eat the living. And, like, you know, we mentioned before, like, earlier about the movies, like, you know, winning awards or being successful as blending genres. And this movie blends, you know, a ton of different genres into one. and has a ton of references and callbacks to other things. 
while not just being, as I think a lot of culture now, the reference, just like in the Scream TV series, just the fact that they referenced something was as far as they went with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this exists. Whereas in this, they actually would take, you know, a scenario or, you know, more in depth like idea and then approach it in a different way and actually not just call out something, but actually reference it and then kind of deconstruct it and do something new with it. Yeah, they didn't just lean on it for a quick gag. They they use it as an opportunity and a jumping off point or 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 it's just something extra where they maybe didn't throw it in your face. But if you if you knew what the reference was or, or where it was from, then you could just kind of appreciate it alongside everything else going going on. Like you did not need to see any other films to to enjoy this as a, as a zombie film alone. Yeah, and, and too, when you look at the the cast at this now, so of course, you know, uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are kind of the main characters. They've went on to become bigger stars. Simon Pegg a little bit more so than Nick Frost because he's been in uh, Mission Impossible, and that series has been in the Star Trek series of Scotty. So he's been in some pretty big, high-profile movies that most people have seen or at least aware of. And he's been in a number of other movies where he is the star. Um, like Ryan Fatboy Ryan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so he's been in other things. But also, um, you know, Bill Nighy was in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... The voice of Darth Maul. <laughs> yeah. And then um, The Hobbit. Uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. <laughs> is in it. Um what Martin Freeman. Oh, is in it in a very, oh, yes, in a very right. small yeah, throwaway yeah. role. Yeah, and Jessica, Jessica Hines from Space. Not that she was like a huge star, but um, yeah, she's with he's with Jessica Hines, and uh, and I had Lucy Davis, who along with Martin Freeman was on the British version of The Office. Yeah, D- Dylan Moran too. He was on Black Books. Um, that was a pretty good uh, little show. I watched both seasons of that with Bill Bailey. Um, who is in Hot Fuzz. Yeah. So they seem to have a, a kind of a big appreciation for, for British actors and normally have a lot of, lot of nice cameos and stuff in those films, which is nice because those films carry, seem to carry international appeal more than most British films do. Yeah, because they have, you know, British-isms of things that are kind of unique to that culture, but are general enough that most people can watch it and be like, oh, okay, yeah. that's, that's, it's just this. Because there's some movies that are very um, kind of specific to their culture, especially things that are kind of self-referential or comedies. And if you're not really in that culture, it's harder to pick up, as opposed to this is more just universal mm-hmm. and... If you know, if you have knowledge of all the zombie movies and the Romero stuff, then it pays that off. But like you said earlier, you don't have to have all the knowledge of those movies to engage with this and enjoy it. Because you know, I've had people watch this who have never seen those movies that this is referencing and really love this. Yeah. And then also people who love those movies originally have watched this and you know are pretty impressed. We, uh, you know, and we saw this the night of the Louisville Zombie Walk too, and we got to see it in at Baxter Avenue Theaters and. Uh, a friend of mine that I brought along, Morgan, she uh, she hadn't watched, I don't think, any zombie movie ever. So horror movies scare her, so she doesn't <laughs> traditionally like watching them. But she, again, like she she really, she really brought it up a couple of times. She's like, I really like that movie, wouldn't see. I was like, I told you you would. You just, yeah. you know, not that she like didn't believe me, but uh, but I kept telling her, like, you're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so luckily we did get to see this in theaters at some point. Yeah. And because there's a lot of these movies, you know, you get a little bit different experience watching it in the, in the theater versus watching it at home. And this is a movie, too, that every time I watch it, I catch something else that they do in there that's, you know, like a visual gag or a reference to something else. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, like, Edgar Wright movies, uh, I mean, he's, he's only made a few, but so what, like, I think in terms of ranking his movies from top to bottom, I still think for me, this is my favorite movie that he's made. Uh, you know, he's made this Hot Fuzz, uh, Scott Pilgrim uh, versus the World, The World's End. He was supposed to make Ant Man, but yeah, dropped he's out. Baby Driver. Now, what else did he do? Fistful of Fingers. That was like his, like you know, no budget. This was his first, I guess. You know, I don't want to say legitimate, but this was his first bigger production. Yeah, because he also directed the show Spaced. 
Yeah. And, you know, that space, show... Space was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing where there is some specific items to British humor, but, you know, it's broad enough that you can enjoy it because, you know, if you like Star Wars, then that's kind of enough to have a basis to get into the show. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely something to check out. I know it was on Hulu for a while. I'm not sure if it still is, but that is a show that they tried to remake for the U.S. audiences, but the palette of it was so bad that it ended up not happening, which is good. thank God. There's a zombie episode, too, on Space um, where Simon Pegg is... uh, been playing too much resident evil too and i think not feeling well is on top of that so he starts seeing people as zombies yeah so it's definitely uh he definitely has a lot of movies i like and also he did one of the fake trailer segments in grindhouse for the movie don't which Mm -hmm. i actually would really like to see him make something like that yeah yeah Yeah. kind of a, a trippy horror film yeah, I mean, because he, he kind of has done that in bits and pieces, and you know, like Shaun of the Dead, but zombies, and then he kind of did a little bit of it with Hot Fuzz. And then Scott Pilgrim versus the World isn't a horror movie in any way, shape, or form, but that's a, a fun uh, comic book adaptation that most people wouldn't recognize that is a comic book because it's kind of like a more indie uh, yeah. hit. And then that movie uh, didn't make a ton of money, but I think it's a the appreciation for that movie has grown over the years. Yeah. It's, I mean that just the trailer got me so excited for that film and it's just a phenomenal on so many levels, especially visuals. Like that's the most visually um, complex film he's ever made. And his his films are already very layered and, and a lot of uh, visual humor where he, he puts the humor in, in the camera too. You see his, his personality come through as much as, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost's and Shaun of the Dead and everything else he does, which is, I think he's just such an integral part of, of that. I mean, really he's for me more so than even Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, you know, like I will follow Edgar Wright to the end of the world (laughs) with whatever he makes (laughs) to the world's end Yeah, to the world's end with whatever he makes. Um, you know, Nick Frost and Simon Pegg, unless they're writing their own stuff, they're kind of at the mercy of, of the directors and whatever projects they take on. But, uh, but yeah, just Shaun of the Dead, it's it was so refreshing and just such a different type of film. Um, you can definitely see his 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 influence um, or Sam Raimi's influence on him and, and even possibly some Peter Jackson, you know, Dead Alive and stuff. Just just the fun and humor and the playfulness of the camera and and how you really he takes advantage of every scene. Um, transition. I know when they're they're writing scripts, they're drawing out the transitions on the side. You know, he's just he is. I mean, he he just you can tell he has a lot in his mind while he's directing. Like he has to keep track of so many things. I'm sure because <laughs> he just takes he does not play it safe when he's directing. Like he has a very specific vision and he executes it expertly every time. So um. I'll have, to, I'll have to add this video in the notes. I'll have to go and find it. But have you seen the video where, I believe it was through Slash Film, where they sit down with Edgar Wright and kind of had him go over, like, his visual techniques and they show, like, examples from the movies. And, you know, even though he's admitted he's a big fan of Sam Raimi and, you know, has talked to him and I think actually when um, Wes Craven passed away, I think yes, uh, yeah. Edgar Wright published a letter that Sam Raimi and him had, dis- or an email that him and Sam Raimi had had back and forth about it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's a big fan of Sam Raimi. He actually said that, you know, in like Shaun of the Dead, some of like the camera movements and, and the editing things were actually references to Martin Scorsese's style mm-hmm. and some of the things he had done in other movies. And I believe that they got the same cinematographer for Shaun of the Dead that worked on uh, Goodfellas to be able to actually do some of like the the zooms and stuff they did. Yeah, I think he was like a camera operator or something on Goodfellas because I was kind of looking that up because I know Bill Pope did Scott Pilgrim and... um I think hot fuzz. Um, but, but yeah, I, I noticed that as well. And I think that letter you were talking about, I think Edgar Wright wrote something about Wes Craven and then Sam Raimi sent him a message about yeah. saying like how touching it was and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, he, you know, has a lot of influences that span a lot of different generations, thing, things like that. But the visual style of Shaun of the Dead was so assured, like that doesn't look really like somebody's first movie. It seems like, uh, you know, something that's usually like a second or third effort from somebody because you see a lot of movies that come out and have like a very stylistic visual style. So something like House of a Thousand Corpses from Rob Zombie where he had like a stylistic uh, approach to the movie. But 
Edgar Wright was very clean, didn't distract from the movie, actually sped things along. Mm-hmm. Like when you watch his movies, even if there's some things you think are boring, like in terms of like visual like aspects on the screen, there is no filler. They're not wasting time no. walking from place to place. Like he very quickly uses transitions and cuts just to keep the action flowing and, you know, to comedic effect too, which is something that a lot of, you know, movies can't do. A lot of directors I, I, have. To- I don't want to cheapen it, but almost like he's a director of the ADD generation. But yeah, <laughs> that's like a compliment. You know, it's like he just he knows how to be so economical with everything he does. Yeah, he uh, he definitely has a style like in two in some in some cases, it seems like he's almost amped it up for, you know, comedic effect, like his editing style, like the um, the end of Hot Fuzz. There's a scene where they get in a cop car and it's like so many continual like quick cuts and things like that. It's almost like a joke in and of itself that he's cutting it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, something like Scott Pilgrim, the editing style on it's very kind of meta um, and, and, you know, quick pace, fighting scenes, things like that. And one of those movies that, you know, even, even though it's based on a comic, it, it, you know, it's kind of like a video game movie, too. Yeah. And it's funny, like when you look at like video game movies, they're all typically terrible. But the best movies that, you know, there's a lot of movies I think kind of feel like a video game. Like kind of like Scott Pilgrim, uh, District Nine, the first Crank movie, Jason Statham. There's a lot of stuff that feels kind of like a video game. Pixels. Uh, <laughs> if you believe that Kevin James can be president and his best friend would be a cable repair guy, Adam Sandler, then yeah. And I think like that's a movie too that became an easy target for everyone to make fun of because it was just bad. And it was, you know, kind of like one of Sony's tentpole releases for this year, and it didn't do anything. It'll probably make money internationally once everything's said and done, because for some reason people still like Adam Sandler. But, you know, it's a shame that stuff like that gets made, and Edgar Wright can't just get the budget and everything for anything he wants to do. Yeah. Just because. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited for Baby Driver. Um, But like I said, anything he announces or starting to do, I'm just... I went into Ant-Man, not, not a little disappointed, but I was just kind of like, I knew the whole time I was thinking, I would be thinking, you know, if, what would this been like if Edgar Wright would have directed it? Um, but I wonder if it would have been just so outrageous on a certain level that, you know, Marvel, it wouldn't fit into that Marvel style, even of directing. Like, to be honest, I feel like he would just show everybody up that's ever directed a Marvel <laughs> film. You know what I mean? Like with the energy yeah. and anything else might feel a little flaccid because they couldn't keep, you know, they wouldn't be able to keep up with him essentially. Cause I think a lot of their movies have been very conventional movies from yeah. the aspect of the production elements and just how it looks on screen. Like there are very few of those movies where you're like, you can feel the hand of an auteur changing the movie. It's mm-hmm. mostly the performances by the stars that make those movies and the special effects. So, I mean, I guess you could say, like, maybe, like, the first Iron Man, you could kind of get the sensibilities of John Favreau, yeah. and then less so with the the later movies. I guess Shane Black but, but, is Iron yeah, Man Yeah, the third one, that's why I appreciate that one, because, like, even if it wasn't a perfect film, like, that's why I appreciate that. And and the Guardians of the Galaxy very much had um, a lot of personality in that film. Uh, oh, why can't I think of James his name? Gunn. Yeah, James Gunn, yeah. You know, you very much felt like um, there was an actual person behind the camera not just uh another film that just comes out you know yeah i mean and and two like one of the things that iron man 3 was that was the one that was probably the most um written and directed like the other movies that someone has done and less like a marvel movie because you know it very much had the set during christmas and the and the style of storytelling yeah. was more similar to like a lethal weapon or something like that than it was to the prior movies and that also it made a lot of money but pissed off a lot of people who are like yeah. the hardcore fans. So maybe that's why they didn't want to go in that route again, having somebody that would, you know, yeah. draw attention to the style of the movie. And but Yeah, they're starting to play it safe. They're making too much money now. <laughs> <laughs> but so like back to, to Shaun of the Dead. So this is like when you rewatch this, you recognize like that the as a zombie film, even though it's kind of I don't, I don't think it's a parody, it's just a, a horror comedy you know, romantic comedy just because it has those elements, like it still delivers the goods from the zombie aspect better than a lot of the movies at the time that were going for it full on. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, like the same year was Dawn of the Dead. And Dawn of the Dead was a movie we've done a, a podcast on before discussing the original and the remake. But I don't think too many people rewatch the 2004 version of Dawn of the Dead. Like it made it, money. It but did not hold up as much as I was expecting it to, to be honest. Yeah, because it like when you have something come out in the same year as Shaun of the Dead. So it's kind of like what Cabin in the Woods has done recently to like that style of horror film. Like it was very odd seeing that in 2012 and then seeing the remake of Evil Dead in 2013. Yeah. And so like that one's odd because you had like Cabin in the Woods that kind of deconstructed that style of movie. And then the Evil Dead remake was a remake that, you know, was produced by the original creators of the Evil Dead that kind of started that entire subgenre. And then, so like, you know, with this, with Shaun of the Dead, in the same year that you had this movie that kind of deconstructed the zombie film, you had something like Dawn of the Dead that just was a pure zombie film with no, like, real deeper subtext or meaning that was just, you know, kind of about the the effects and the action and things like that versus, you know, anything anything commenting on how you would actually deal with zombies. Yeah. It was just, yeah, it was very much, uh, you know, and I, I think he... He made a good film for the time, but it did it aged yeah it aged poorly and and again you watch it something like next to Shaun of the Dead and it just doesn't keep up on many levels not just the directing but like as you said like the thematic levels and just there's just so many things about it that uh, is is kind of different as that film was when it came out it's it it maybe it feels by the numbers now because there's so many people that that took that easy approach to kind of copying what, what Dawn of the Dead did because it is. It is something more easy to mimic, um, aside from Shaun of the Dead, because it's just so bold and and it's just it has so much of his personality in there. You can't just take somebody's you know heart and soul out of a film and and repackage that. And and two, like I mentioned earlier, like with Edgar Wright, like that was his first you know big feature film that got you know, like international distribution things like that. Like you know his style was very present and you know kind of what it eventually always is. You know it wasn't like the first iteration of a style he later developed. As opposed to Dawn with the Dead, that was kind of a very straight movie in terms of like the editing style that um, would later be changed and you know or become much more prominent mm-hmm. in the later movies. The Zack Snyder did like Three Hundred and Sucker Punch and you know the later movies. So with like Edgar Wright, you know, 2004, both of those filmmakers kind of had their first kind of big hit. And, you know, I would say Edgar Wright's style was kind of there. It took Zack Snyder years to kind of get what his style was. And now his style in and of itself has kind of been parody, like the the speed ramping, slow motion, fast yeah. motion, fight style. Yeah. And Again, it, you know, his, he just, his stuff becomes dated really fast. You know, I think that's what it is. You just, you're inundated with it and it's something very easy to kind of poke fun at. Whereas, you know, like, you know, Edgar Wright, so, you know, Shaun of the Dead, how the, you know, like quick cuts and a lot of the editing style that, you know, things are pulled from Evil Dead and Scorsese movies and, you know, a lot of blending of, of different elements, just kind of ramping up the speed of them and the amount of them. But, you know, the performance in this movie is too, so we're very good. Uh, like I said, you know, it has a good cast when you think about who is in it now, like, it had somebody who'd be one of the bigger stars in the world right now with Martin Freeman, who was just in a throwaway mm-hmm. role for three seconds in, in one scene. Yeah. And, you know, Simon Pegg and, and Nick Frost, they do have, they had that great, you know, chemistry and camaraderie of like people that have been friends forever and that, you know, get along great. And you just kind of really bought that. And, you know, even though, you know, it's different from like England to, you know, America, how stuff works you could very much see people you know that kind of fit in that mold it, it very much you know fills that it's like that counterculture you know film kind of like a a clerks or something where people of like you said that generation just identify with it right away with the, with these characters and uh like i think one small note so when they were playing the uh the video game they played throughout the movie if i remember correctly i think that was time splitters yeah I think it was two, one or two. I don't know which one, but yeah, which is actually, from what I remember, was a very good game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) But that was um, from the studio that made Goldeneye, I believe, or a lot of the creative team that was behind that game. Yeah. And yeah, Edgar Wright, again, we, we grew up with video games. Edgar Wright, you know, very much the same generation. He's, 
he was born in like 74. Um, but yeah, he's, and you can tell that, like you can tell it comes from a place of sincerity and not where say something like pixels, you know, I didn't see the film, didn't hear great things about it, but it felt very much like a package thing. Um, and not, not something that somebody was making due to uh, a passion for yeah, it. Well, I mean, I did see that movie, unfortunately, uh, mostly just because everybody got drunk and it was the bar was next to the theater. But uh, <laughs> that was a movie where it was very much just like just referencing that things existed was what they did with it. And they didn't really do anything all that interesting with the concept. And one little nitpick I always have with movies and TV when they show video games on screen that Shaun the Dead got right is they use the actual sound effects from the game. Mm -hmm. When the characters had the controllers in their hand, they're doing the types of movements you would actually do when playing that game. They weren't doing some yeah. super heightened, like slamming their hand against the controller and touching every button on it, you know, a thousand times. We uh, we were working on a little short film for a film festival in college. You remember that? And we kind of made fun of that. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that at all? We had a friend of ours, Evan, playing a game and him just like hammering on the controller. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I just now remember that. I totally forgot about the entire situation until you brought that up. But yeah, it's it's that attention to, you know, even that, it's a small thing, but it's that attention to detail that is just layered throughout all of his films. And they were from the beginning. You know, he's yeah. just, he isn't, he isn't, I'm not saying he's completely natural because he made a lot of short films when he was younger and, and developed his talent, but it, he is very much a master, you know, of his craft. Yeah, I mean, like, if you look at the current crop of directors that are out there, he's one of the people I'm always the most interested in what they're doing. Because, um, you know, like, his work output lately, I'd say that, like, sensibility-wise, he's kind of, like, a little bit more modern Tarantino in that he has a wealth of knowledge of all these B-movies and all these different things. It kind of blends all of it together in the movies he makes. So although he makes, like, original creations, it kind of pulls ideas from a lot of places. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I mean, he's definitely, you know, like his movies haven't been as big as Tarantino's, but I think that he's doing better work than Tarantino now, or at least yeah. things like, you know, like even though like Hateful Eight looks really cool and I'm interested in it, I still have a twinge of like with um, Django Unchained, it was a bit long, and but then again, uh, Edgar Wright's The World's End wasn't something that I was as crazy about as his prior movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I didn't seem like that film had as long to ferment, you know, Yeah, on, on different levels. Um, still great and still well above most films that come. But uh, but yeah, it's like Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz and even Scott Pilgrim for me. Like those films, those are at the top of my list of I can't really argue anything against those movies of, you know, not being one of my favorite films. Like they, they, they all bring something different and just so much to the table. Um, but Shaun of the Dead, I think that that may have been the one I've seen the most. Hot Fuzz is probably right up there as well. But I just started watching that because I'd seen Shaun of the Dead so much. And then Hot Fuzz came out and I was like, oh, awesome. Another Edgar Wright film. And that's when I just started having that film on repeat. Um, but yeah, like you said, the films, especially, you know, all of his movies are just so layered and there's just so many things where you can rewatch them or rewatch them and find so many different gags and throwaway jokes and stuff. Um, yeah, Sh Shaun of the Dead, it's it's definitely one that quickly solidified its its place in, in horror history. And I see on their IMDb page, too, just some news article, and it, uh, I can't find it now, but basically it said, you know, oh, there's these new, uh, new Shaun of the Dead action figures, and that was posted from a couple days ago. Yeah. So it's just, they're just, it's still a huge cultural... Um, touchstone for for the counterculture films and and horror films well it's and it's something too that like you said like you took when we went and saw it, one of your friends went with us that you know hadn't seen it before and it totally holds up there's nothing about it that you know severely dates it or makes it kind of an of the time movie like if you were to watch it today the only things that really would tell anybody that it's not like from the past couple of years is that the cell phones are from 2000 you know three whenever they film this or four versus being like iPhones or Android phones. Yeah. But aside from that, there's really nothing in it that dates it. Yeah. It's just, it holds up incredibly well because it doesn't feel like it was made in 2004. You know, it's yeah. over a decade old now. And, and how many films from 85 did not seem dated when you watched them, you know, when you were 10 years old in 95. Yeah. 
And like as much as I love Back to the Future, you can definitely tell that those came from a slightly different era. <laughs> Especially because they keep saying 1985 in the film. <laughs> yeah, and like Huey, Huey Lewis and the News yeah. and all the music. Yeah. As opposed to this, like the only music that really played in the like the the music like contemporary music in the movie itself that they listened to was like Queen. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you know, it, it wasn't any movie. flavor flavor of the the week type type music. Um, Scott Paragon, if that becomes dated because of the music, it it's it's one it's one it's one side of it that'll be almost endearing. You know, like a lot of '80s films, because it has so much of that. You know, that's what it's about. It's about you know Scott Pilgrim growing up in this era at this time and everything that has influenced his life and his music and everything. So it's very appropriate for that film, and I think it'll only make it you know like I said more endearing over time. But yeah, he knows exactly. Even Hot Fuzz, like any music he uses, is he just makes great musical choices that uh, that feel modern, but also don't really date the films. So if you had to to place this movie in the overall landscape of zombie films, like for me, I think that I think we mentioned this before. Like, so you know, like of course you have the Romero films, kind of at the top of the heap because they. At least, you know, like the first two and Day of the Dead still is pretty, you know, it's a fun movie and has a lot of fans. But, you know, like Night of the Living Dead and, and Dawn of the Dead were kind of the movies that created the genre of what it became and how those movies were made for years after. And so, you know, like those are kind of like on their own plane. So it's kind of like, well, how do you rate everything else? And I think for me, Shaun of the Dead falls pretty close to the top of the pack because it references the existence of zombies and you know, makes callbacks to those movies while doing something interesting and new with it that isn't, the entire movie isn't predicated on, like, a lot of the foreign zombie films, like, boobs and, like, Mm -hmm. slight gore here and there. It was, like, a fully coherent movie that had believable characters, believable romance and all that stuff tied into a zombie story, and everything just fed into each other and came out with, you know, a great overall result. Yeah, it's, like you said, it's really hard to kind of rank that stuff, like Romero... Romero's uh yeah it's hard to put anything above that above his films um but then even stuff like you know quote unquote zombies like dead alive and, and films like that that are that are phenomenal uh Shaun of the Dead it's just for me it'll like hold a special place just because it did come out you know when I was well, I don't remember how old a 19 years old 18 19 years old you yeah. know so it's like it, you know, you feel some type of ownership, just like people who grew up watching Star Wars and saw it in theaters when it came out. Like they're going to have a connection to that, you know, way past those of us who kind of grew up after the fact. Yeah. Um, so it's just I can't really put anything, you know, put put a number on it or place because I just have just, just a strong, um, just strong feelings towards it. And I've watched I've watched it more than any other zombie film. So if that tells you anything, you know. Yeah. Cause, but uh, b- before that, like Night of Living Dead, when I discovered that film, was in love with that film. Uh, then when I watched Dawn of the Dead, um, the Night of Living Dead remake, which I really liked. Um, then I watched Day of the Dead after that. Like, but yeah, this is the film, I've, the zombie film I have watched the most because it is so layered and it's, you know, of our time. But at the same time, it's it doesn't really date itself, unlike all of the Romero films, which that that's intentional. They were both, you know, they were made, he made a new one like every decade to kind of comment on society at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is definitely probably one of my most, most watched films of all time also. Yeah. I mean, like if I had to rank, cause you know, it's very tough to say like, Oh, these are the best movies. Like in terms of my favorite mm-hmm. movies, it's definitely in the top 10 likely because I've just watched it so many times. And it's still entertaining, and it's still something that you can show people today that haven't seen it, and there's nothing that you have to, the you know, explain away or be like, well, but there is this part where this or the special effects are kind of bad. Like everything about it, yeah, it still stands up and is you know definitely uh, going to entertain anybody who watches it, unless yeah. they just hate zombies. <laughs> Which, mm-hmm. based on the current culture, I don't see that being uh, a <laughs> thing that will happen anytime soon. So, uh, do we have any final thoughts on this before we wrap up? Uh, this is one of those films that's just like a big part of, like you know, both of our lives. Um, 
and just something we've watched over and over over the years. So it is it is kind of hard to do this film justice. But um, yeah, Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright wrote it, so they get so much credit. But, and and the cast is amazing. But for me, like Edgar Wright, he is he is the reason this film has has held up to the test of time. I think and and what gives it its its life. Um, and I, I can cannot wait to see what he does next. But I, and I, and I I would like to see him do another horror film eventually. But I'm fine with whatever he does for a while. You know, yeah. there's some of those directors that you know you people talk about Tarantino. I want to see him do like a regular horror film aside from Death Proof. Um, but yeah, Tarantino's. You know, people are like, oh, another western. I mean, I'm I'm happy with it. But uh, but Ed, you're right. Uh, whatever he wants to do, I'll watch it. But I'm would be so interested to see him do another another horror film and it's this isn't a film that i ever want a sequel to yeah it just it, it's so perfect the way it is and and he you know he has more tricks in his bag they they all do obviously with hot fuzz the world's in like they don't need to rely on this film and it's it's great that it'll probably never get a sequel yeah um and let's Pray to God it never gets a remake. <laughs> We're going to be one of those people now that are like, no, why do they remake this? They can't remake that. Film. Well, I think like that's a movie where like, you know, even with Edgar Wright's career, he hasn't really made sequels, or anything. He's just made like thematic. So he had like, you know, the three movies of the Cornetto, the Cornetto trilogy where Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz and the World's End. So it's more of just like spiritual successors with different stories mm-hmm. and, and all that. So I don't think he'll ever come back to this. And no, yeah. I don't know that the name recognition alone is enough to to have them remake a movie of this series. Maybe they can make another one in a, in the style of it. Yeah, but you know, it's like one of those things. It's such a big part of pop culture. I know it's not as big as as certain things, but you know, from the movies that they're starting to dig in the well of remaking because they've already remade so many <laughs> other films. Like I could see in heaven forbid, let's say maybe fifteen years. You know. I was going to say 10 because, I mean, time goes by fast. But you could see this sometimes in our lifetime, them saying, oh, we're going to remake Shaun of the Dead. You know, just because when this film is 30 years old, it might be one of those things where they're like, oh, well, this has some name recognition. We can remake this. and um, But I hope it never does. But I hope it continues to live on as well. Yeah. And, hey, if it did get remade, uh, if for some reason it fell out of public consciousness with some people, then hopefully it would just reintroduce it to a whole new audience. Yeah, man. and think too, like the the impact of it is a little bit greater than what the box office numbers were because it made around like fourteen million dollars in the U.S. and more in, in overseas. So it was a profitable movie, but it wasn't like a, a huge hit. But um, like in uh, Scream Four, the movie they're watching on the TV, so like in all the Scream movie or Wes Craven movies before, you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street, they're watching Evil Dead. So you know, he's had a a history of like including movies that he thought were good or influential at the time, like mm-hmm. in movies he's made and in uh, screen four, they're watching Shaun of the dead, which I think also kind of played into the type of movie they were using or that they were telling with the characters and, and the, you know, that series being kind of self-referential. So, you know, like Wes Craven thought it was important enough to, you know, yeah. put in his movie and, you know, out of the people the like directors working today, like out of the ones I'm interested in seeing their output, you know, Edgar Wright's right at the top of the list. You know, and like Sam Raimi was kind of the director that I really loved and got into like wanting to learn about how to make movies because of. And, you know, I just feel like a little bit of similarity in their styles. Mm -hmm. Um, Although, you know, like Sam Raimi's had some hits and misses in the past few years. He definitely still has my interest. uh, And still, it's going to be it's kind of sad that on the uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead series, he's only directing one episode in season in this first season. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if he got Edgar Wright in on some? <laughs> like, oh, well, if if him if him and Edgar Wright, you know, season two they just bounce <laughs> back and forth. Oh my god, I would I would just like, and they just you know there would be that friendly competition too, probably where they yeah. just try to one up each other and just kept pushing the crew and just everybody like that. That could be so exciting. When um, apparently um, when uh, they were trying to get um, uh, drive me to hell. Uh, in production there's a while where sam raimi was busy i think it was maybe with spider-man 3 and he offered uh edgar wright to direct it and i didn't know that and edgar wright uh said well it'd be kind of me just kind of coming in it wouldn't really have my stamp on it and i wouldn't want to you know just try to replicate your style and with your script and, and your movie 
So, you know, kind of just said that he didn't want to do it because of that. And then eventually Sam Raimi got time to do it and got it out in 2009. Yeah, I, I heard the studio didn't really want to do it unless he was directing. He couldn't kind of force their hand to, to get that film made, which... Which thank God, you know, I'm glad the studio forced him yeah. to forced him to direct it because it's it, it's a super fresh, you know, it was a super fresh film, even though it was his style that's been around for a long time. Um, but yeah, I would just love to see those two guys hell do an anthology <laughs> film where each of them direct a couple of segments. Yeah, that would be something that <laughs> will probably never happen. But if it did, yeah, I would need to. Uh, wear some rubber pants or something went to the theater. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely take <laughs> off work for that. Just clear out the whole weekend to see that a few times because it would be so layered with so many jokes and stuff. Um, yeah, just there's not enough that can be said about Shaun of the Dead or or really all of Edgar Wright's work. I know this kind of turned into Edgar Wright love fest, <laughs> but, uh, Let's, but Shaun of the Dead, I mean, who for the most part, who hasn't seen that? It's watching horror films right now. Um and, and what more can you say about it? You know, this is not, I don't, it's, it's hard to find a hater of this film. Like, I guess the only person that could really, really hate this is if they only want to watch movies where it's nothing but like continued violence and gore. But in yeah. a lot of like the lower end, like cheaper zombie flicks, that's like, they don't really have much going on because of the low budgets. Cause there's a lot of zombie movies made in like the eighties and, and, and during that time period where, there wasn't all that much going on when you actually sat and thought about the movie. And like mm-hmm. I said, you know, like there's a lot of good Italian zombie movies, but a lot of them also have the zombies themselves few and far between. And it's just people, you know, walking around. There's usually some boobs involved and things like that. But, you know, Shaun of the Desmond's movies, it's a tight, fast movie. It never drags when you're watching it. And, you know, the humor is still relevant today. There's nothing that's extremely topical of the time. And even the British isms are enough that, you know, like my dad can watch it and pick up all the jokes, you know, even though, yeah. like, what's a crisp? It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, yes, yeah, so I think we've thoroughly, um, pulled the pants of Shaun the Dead down and gave it a good time on this episode. <laughs> yeah. Th- yeah. This is one of our favorite films and it has been since, since we saw it a decade ago and it will continue to probably be. One of our favorite films of all time, I think, that would, you know, in, in a general ballpark area. And like, I have a number of friends who don't really care much for horror movies, but still have this as one of their favorite movies and watch it, you know, still pull yeah. out and watch all the time. So it's a movie that kind of, you know, one of those four corner movies kind of hits all the different, the audiences. Because even if somebody hasn't seen it, you can probably sit them down, they'll watch it and enjoy it. Just because it, you know, it's got romantic comedy in it. It's got just, you know, normal comedy. It's got zombies and gore, but it's not so overwhelming that it's scary. Yeah, I, ho- I hope the DVD sales really um, kind of helped it make a lot of money back, you know, even though it, it, it made it. You know, and too, when I bought this film, I remember buying it from Myers because I was really excited when it came out. I went there that night and I bought a, they had a double pack, that and the Dawn of the Dead remake, <laughs> <laughs> which was interesting. But that's how I, uh, how I bought this film. Yeah, so they definitely... Uh... And I just threw the Dawn of the Dead remake away. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't even know where that's at, but my Shaun of the Dead DVD, that got played so many times. Dawn of the Dead, maybe once or twice. Maybe yeah. a few, I, I've probably like five or six times. Like I liked it when it came out well enough, you know, and I, it was fun watching those two films, but Shaun of the Dead was far and away, even at the time, just leaps and bounds above um, in most everything else that was out. Yeah, it gets to, um, we went to the uh, the zombie walk, which we have done. We did a few videos on one. Of the second one, we interviewed people there. Or Corey interviewed some people, just asked them what their favorite zombie movie was. Surprisingly, no one said Shaun of the Dead. But we didn't ask a ton of people, just because a lot of people didn't want to be bothered, and a lot of people there really like. I cut out a bunch of it. People didn't watch zombie movies, and he asked, them, "What's your favorite zombie movie?" And everybody said, "Oh, The Walking Dead." He's like, "Well, I said movie." Right? Yeah, and they're like, "Oh, I don't really watch any movies," but. Like the ones people did mention was Zombie Land, which is one that, uh, you know, is a, it's also a comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was a fun movie at the time. I don't know that it's going to stand the test of time or be something people go back to. Very yeah, much. I think that one's already kind of drifting, drifting off. I enjoyed it when it when it came well, out. They but made yeah. the uh, the Amazon pilot of it that didn't go anywhere. Oh, but uh, so you know, you had like Zombie Land. Um, a few people had said 
uh, somebody said 20 Days Later, which you know, it's still a good movie. It's kind of the same era as Shaun of the Dead, but I don't ever really see myself go back, going back and watching that yeah. movie a lot, even though it's by Danny Fact Boyle, that, who, who won an Oscar. But That was exciting at the time. I was... I was kind of excited for that and really enjoyed seeing that in theaters. Um, but also, too, I was starving for any type of zombie-ish film. I know yeah. those those aren't traditional; those aren't really zombies, and, and they run, but that's because they're not zombies. Um, but a uh, quick antidote: Do you remember the poster for that film or the the standees that had the biological symbol on there? Yes, you know, like that that symbol. Yeah, uh, a friend that I worked with at uh, Mike Winnings fish restaurant local fish restaurant probably like six months before that film started came out or before they start advertising he got that symbol on his arm <laughs> and then like right as soon as he got it they started advertising for the film and everybody thought would ask him like did you get that because of 28 days <laughs> later and he made him so pissed off <laughs> so that's another reason why that film holds a special place in my heart <laughs> yeah it was um i went for a walk one day back um uh, around my neighborhood and somebody had that symbol on their motorcycle and then think like they actually had like zombie escape vehicle or something on it yeah <laughs> but, i've seen that yeah but you know uh so like back like other zombie movies that people mentioned it seemed like people mostly like the ones who were you know like our age or older almost everybody i think they just mostly said dawn of the dead the romero version which makes sense because that's kind of you know one of the temple movies uh somebody said resident evil uh which we've discussed before. I hate that series and that director. Um, and I think there's a few other ones, but it's just interesting to hear the the movies that people like. Because, uh, like I said, I don't think anybody's really gonna be talking about Zombie Land ten years from now. But yeah, I, I, are you are you zombied out? I think that it is a like horror subgenre that's been thoroughly done to death between the yeah. TV shows and the movies and the video games and just general cultural Yeah, that's icons. what I got thinking, you know. I kind of got on that kick. I mean, I watched some, you know, zombie films that weren't, you know, weren't Romero films and stuff in the early 90s. But, you know, starting with Resident Evil, like in 96 or whatever, like from that point on, I was kind of in it full, you know, balls deep into into the zombie genre as far as Resident Evil games and then Resident Evil 2 and then I started watching Romero stuff so I stuck with it a while and I'm like I'm kind of over it for the most part like that is not I'm watching Fear the Walking Dead because I'm hoping it's a good show um, and I'm hoping they do interesting things but yeah I'm but I think I get like stuff like that like I, Star Wars I got really done with that for a while I'm, I'm willing to give this new movie a chance and I'm kind of actually starting to get a little bit excited for a couple things I've seen, but I just got so over or how much everything was inundated with, you know, the, the TV show, even though I didn't watch them, TV shows, all the games, there was always talk of the comic books and it was just so much stuff. I was like, okay, you know, I'm done with that. Packed up, packed up the DVDs, <laughs> put them in the closet. Um, and, and zombie films, I don't know if I'll ever be that way completely, but I'm definitely, I've definitely had my time with them and I'm, and I think that's why I'm always looking for something new, movies that do something interesting, because it's just, yeah, it's just been beat in the dirt but then you've, at this point. You've had something like uh, World War Z, which was a very well-liked book and like the audio book for it. I actually had like an amazing voice cast of people who were on it, you know, like Nathan Fillion, like all these different actors and things. So you had like this property that was well-loved and been around for a while. And they finally made the movie and it was like a, you know, huge budget Brad Pitt action film that's PG-13 that made a lot of money across the world. And so you just kind of had it go from like, because they used to be just like these quirky movies that were kind yeah. of, you know, like schlocky B movies that had like an audience. And then now they've become like this cultural phenomenon where everybody's trying to get their piece of it and they make it into like a $100 million Brad Pitt star vehicle. And like for something that has anything to do with zombies these days to get my attention, it has to be something really special and something from somebody that has a track record track record of making good content. Mm -hmm. And even like, you know, late era George Romero stuff like Diary of the Dead and um uh what was the other one he made? Survival of the Dead. Yeah, Survival of the Dead. Like, even though even though it's George Romero, I just those yeah. did not land for me or for many other people based on the yeah. amount of money they made. 
Land of the Dead did not do what his originals did, but I really enjoyed that when it came out, and I watched that not that long ago, and I still like that film a lot. It does a lot of things. It has a, a, so a great cast in there in that film, like phenomenal cast, um, and it's not perfect, but I I just enjoy watching. I enjoy watching that film. Like I like the people in there. Um, well, and two with that one, unlike Diary of the Dead, technically it's all fine and it's you know good yeah. to watch as opposed. To, yeah, there's no um footage shot first person from a Nokia cell phone camera. <laughs> that uh, yeah, it looks HD resolution. <laughs> yeah, so so the zombie genre is you know much different place than it was when Shaun of the Dead came out because uh, like I said, it was just kind of a slight resurgence of a few movies that kind of brought zombies back into the popular popular consciousness again in a big way like as you said though like resident evil those games they were you know they brought them back into the popular uh consciousness from at least the video game perspective in the 90s mm-hmm. but then like there's a group of movies in the 2000s that kind of really brought it back on the big screen and then the walking dead became a huge phenomenon and brought them to tv and now there's even i zombie on the cw that <laughs> something we've never covered yeah. just because it didn't really seem like anything i'd ever want to watch but uh, I think that'll bring this discussion of Shaun the Dead and everything else we've touched on to a close. Uh, if you want to find the work we're doing, you can always go to housebythevideostore.com and you can follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vine, YouTube, Vimeo. Uh, we even have a Reddit account. You can find links to all those on the website at housebythevideostore.com. Uh, and if you want to give us a review for the podcast in iTunes, you can do that. Uh, that'll help us out. Uh, and if you want to find what we're doing specifically on the internet, you can find me on Twitter at will underscore droid. And I'm at, I'm at Blevin Sean. And what is Derek's again? Uh, he mostly uses Instagram and it's at meta world Derek. Yeah. He doesn't post a ton of horror related content, but sometimes <laughs> if you need, if you need to like, uh, you know, complain at any of his opinions or whatever just <laughs> send him a dm he's, he's also on twitter too yeah uh, and, we'll, and we'll, we tag ourselves in some of the tweets from our official account we also have a donation link up on the website the top banner um help us with server costs for the site for the podcast um a bunch of other stuff we're currently getting uh, a prop made for a film ideal william has and we we may end up having to use it also for a 48 hour film festival project we're doing here in Louisville that is horror themed. So hopefully we'll have a, uh, a horror short up on the site in about a month, maybe yeah. right before Halloween. Yeah. Um, Some more original uh, content if we can get the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I, did I already say I'm at Blevin Sean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it, right? We're going to do the Green Inferno next week if we have time. Yeah, if we, can, see if we can get to the theater, we will do the Eli Roth film, Green Inferno. He has another movie coming out soon, too, Knock Knock with uh, Keanu Reeves. I'm I'm kind of excited for that. Um, Green Inferno, it was supposed to come out last year. You know, it's one of those things, you wait on it, you wait on it, and finally you're like, okay, I'm tired of waiting. Uh, well, then there was also the Ty West movie of a similar uh, genre that was in the, um, the Sacrament, I believe. Yeah. That so that you know, like have a few movies kind of like this cannibal holocaust, you know, inspired movie. Uh but if we have if we get to the theater, that'll be the one we talk about on the podcast next week. So as always, thanks for listening. House by the video store.